And uh, yeah, so today we'll talk about non-commutative optimization. Uh, lots of words. It's the just joint work with uh, Peter, with Cole, Ankit, uh, Avi, and Michael. Uh, this talk, don't worry, will be very light. And please ask me any, any questions at any time. I'll, I'll use the board as well to slow myself down. So, OK, so what are we going to talk about today? I'm going to give you a lot of motivation, because you need to be motivated to learn something completely different. And then we'll talk about the null cone problem and norm minimization problems. We're going to talk about these moment maps, which are gradients, like these non-commutative gradients, and then these magical polytopes that arise from this non-commutative optimization. Then we're going to learn how to optimize, give you some algorithms, and there's lots of open problems. Okay? So, okay, unexpected applications, that's for some of you are not so unexpected because you've been hearing us talking about this for a while, right? So Algebraic identity. So if I give you an arithmetic formula with inversion gates, is it identically zero? So if you know the polynomial identity testing, this is the non-commutative version of it for rational functions, rational expressions, OK? So this is one problem. Second problem is in a priori in quantum information, which is the one-body quantum marginal problem, which is if I give you a quantum state with many particles, and then I give you density matrices describing the local state of each particle. So I give you the marginal distribution of each particle. The question is, is there a consistent global pure state that exhibits all these marginals? Okay, can I obtain, uh, do, do these particles come from a pure state? Could they come from a pure state? Um, the third field is analytic inequalities. So if I give you linear maps, uh, AI from RN to RNI, and I give you real numbers P1 up to PM, uh, what I want to know if, if, I, if there exists an inequality of this form. And what do I mean by inequality of this form? If there exists some constant, C, uh, which is independent of, of these functions, such that for all integrable uh, non-negative functions fi, and each fi goes from r and i to the reals, uh, if this inequality holds. Okay? So if I give you these linear maps and the reals, I want to know if, if an inequality of this type exists. Okay? This is called the brassken plebe inequalities. And they generalize essentially all the inequalities that you can think about. Um, OK. And the fourth problem is the eigenvalues of sums of Hermitian matrices. So if I give you uh, a set of spectra, OK, I give you the eigenvalues in uh, non-increasing order, lambda A, lambda B, lambda C, are there Hermitian matrices A, B, C with these eigenvalues such that A plus B is equal to C? OK, this is a very famous and old problem uh, called Horn's problem. Um, and as we'll see in this talk, all of these problems are instances of optimization over non-commutative groups. Okay, so it's problems from all of the many areas that are coming. Um, there are instances of this, of this paradigm of non-commutative optimization. Okay, so now um, let's just talk about a little bit of invariant theory so we know what non-commutative optimization means, right? So, Usually, we're going to be talking about a group G acting linearly on a vector space V. So here's an example. If I have V equal to the complex numbers to the N, and G uh, is the permutation group, and it acts simply by permuting the coordinates. So if I have a permutation sigma, I act on my vector V1, like V, which is V1 up to Vn, and I just permute the coordinates. Okay, that's a group acting linearly on a vector space. Um, another example is. I have the group of matrices, the vector space of matrices, complex matrices, and I have the general linear group, so all the invertible matrices, and is acting by conjugation. Okay, that's also a linear matrix, right? A linear action because I can just add the matrices A, like A plus B, and the action is the same. Uh, and then another group that you may have heard of, right, is the group responsible for the matrix scaling problem. And here the vector space is the space of complex matrices. Uh, and my group now is this um, STN, which is we call the special torus. And the definition is here. OK, great. So you have the torus, which is the set of all diagonal matrices with determinant non-zero. The special torus is only the set of all diagonal matrices with determinant one. OK? So and how does this? You know, group the product of two torus acts on the matrix scaling. So this first diagonal matrix acts by scaling the rows of the matrix, and this one scales the columns of the matrix. Okay, 
uh, and for this talk, all of our groups will be continuous. If you care about like being really, um, you know, will be connected, reductive, and algebraic groups. But anyways, you should just think of continuous groups. So like these two groups are very good. This group we're not going to study, right? Because the permutation group is discrete. Okay, so we should think of these bottom two groups. Okay, now, um, yes. Uh, well, if I do conjugation, is another problem, right? Here I'm allowing, like, I have, like, uh, 2 n minus 1 degrees of freedom. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's what, yeah. I guess that was my question. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, okay. And now, so we have the group acting on a vector space, and now we want to study some algebraic, like, nice properties that they have. And since we're talking about algebra, so we have these invariant polynomials, right? So these are polynomials that don't change by the action of your group G. What does that mean? So I have some polynomial on the variables x. And once I apply the action g on x, so, so think of x as your, vector, as your vector. Once I apply g to x, the value of this polynomial does not change for all the values of the group. Okay. So here are some examples. Uh, again, if I take the group uh, c to the n and I have the symmetric group permuting the coordinates, here are some invariant polynomials that you know. If I apply any permutation on the sums of powers, I get the sums of powers again, right? Um, and if I have the matrix group and I have the conjugation action, <coughs> we can see that this polynomial, so the trace of the power, of the kth power, is invariant, right? Because the trace of this kth power is essentially g a to the k to g minus 1, and trace is cyclic, and you get trace of a to the k back, right? <coughs> so far, so good. Um, and then, <clears throat> now let's go to the matrix scaling problem. And what do we have here as invariant polynomials? Well, if you look at your matrix A and you take a permutation sigma, so think of it as a generalized matching, right? So your matching is given by this permutation sigma. Now, if I look at the action, so if I have the action here of B equals to this diagonal alpha acting on AB, this product. Uh, this is the product of the entries like bi sigma i, right? Because bi sigma i there is going to be ai sigma i. I'm scaling the row by alpha i, and I'm scaling the column by beta i, right? Once I pull them all out of the products, I get the product of ai, product of b of sigma i, but sigma is a permutation. So I get product of beta i. And both of these are 1, right? Because remember, I'm in the special torus group, right? So this is also an invariant polynomial. Yeah. So the second, the last example is fine. The one before, so polynomial gets its entries and elements in B and gives out entries in G, or where? Yes, yes. Because the trace. Oh, so no, it's it's just a compressed number. Yeah, yeah, but it's, no, ah, it's, yeah, it's a polynomial. So you get your input is an element of V of your vector space, and your output is a number. It's a polynomial on the on vector the space. Entries of the vector space. On the entries of the vector, yeah. Mm -hmm. OK, very good. Um, all right. And now uh, let's talk about the geometric property of these uh, groups acting on vector spaces, right? Because at some point, we'll do optimization. So we need to have some sort of geometry. So given a point v, um, an important object is its orbit, OK? So what is the orbit of v with respect to the group is, well, I simply take v. And I take all elements of the group, and I act on v, and I take this set. Okay, so this is all the elements that are reachable by v uh, under the action of g. And since we're talking about, um, since there is algebra involved, we, the important objects here are the closure of these orbits. Okay, so the closure of these orbits is essentially the orbit with its limit points. Okay, you can think of limit points in the Euclidean topology. It's fine, right? Like whatever you can reach closer, you can throw that into this g v bar. Also, this can be seen as the zero set of all the polynomials that vanish on the orbit. OK? Why? I think the zero set could be large. The zero set could be large? No. You started with the closed orbit. That's orbit closure that starts. Oh, yeah. OK. Sure. OK. Yeah, erase this. OK. Thank you, Visu. That's right. 
Um, okay, let's just take the orbit and add its, its, uh, its limit points. You're right, like if the closed orbit is closed, you pick up all the things that have the closed orbit. Okay, so fake news. Um, okay, um, let's go to the, and in particular, uh, there's one set which is the null cone, which is a very important set, uh, which is a set of all vectors v such that zero is in the orbit closure, uh, is in the orbit closure of v, okay? So the set is very important, we'll see very soon. And this gives us the null cone problem, which is a very important problem, and we'll see why this problem is very important later. Okay, the null cone problem is, if I give you as an input a vector v in my vector space, I want to know if zero is in its orbit closure. Okay? So why is this problem important? Well, Hilbert in his seminal paper in 1893 and then Mumford in 65, uh, they proved that the null cone is the zero set of all the homogeneous non-constant invariant polynomials. Okay, so this set is also an algebraic variety. Okay, uh, this has huge consequences for finiteness of invariance. And, but if you notice, as we'll see later, this null cone problem is an optimization problem, right? Because zero is in uh, the orbit closure if and only if, <coughs> when you minimize the norm over the orbit, you're gonna hit zero, right? Because zero is the element of minimum norm. So once you minimize the norm, uh, you can check if zero is that element or not. So this problem, as we'll see in more detail later, is an optimization problem. And it captures many interesting problems in math, physics, and computer science. Yeah? Yes. Yes, it's already impressive and yes. Okay, so let's see some examples of null cones, right? So if, I, again, I have my group V and the permutation group acting by permuting the coordinates, well, let's take all the invariants, right? So all the invariants form a ring, but let's just take the generators of these invariants. So the invariants are generated by the sums of powers of polynomials. And, but I mean, since the group is discrete anyways, my, my null cone is only the zero set, the, the zero vector. Okay, there's nothing else there besides the zero vector. Okay? This is because it's a discrete set. It's because it's a discrete group, yeah. So there are no limits. No limits, yeah, there's no limits, exactly. Um, yeah, also you could see through the invariance, right? Like, because you're discrete, also your invariance. Um, okay, now let's see the conjugation action, right? So again, we saw that if I have the conjugation action, the invariants are these traces of powers of matrices, right? So what is the null cone here is the set of new potent matrices, okay? So all the matrices that when you power, some of them are gonna be zero, <laughs> eventually. Uh, and then, now we have the matrix scaling problem, right? And then we have our invariants that we saw that these are these like generalized matchings, right? Like the polynomials coming from these permutations. And here, the null cone is the set of all matrices A, and I indexed by AH, whose support has no perfect bipartite matching. Right, so if you think of a matrix, uh, so if I have a matrix, let me say AH, and I'm saying that H is, is its support, right? So if I draw this matrix here, for example, 1, 1, 1, 2, 3. So the support is all its non-zero entries, and I can draw this bipartite graph, H, which is, well, the first row is connected to everybody because the support is non-zero, and then the second row and the third row is connected to um, the first element, okay? So this is the bipartite graphing arising from the support of A, right? And we saw because of this, the invariants are all the matchings, you're in the null cone if your support has no perfect matching. Okay? Okay, and we'll see many more examples of null cone problems, and we, we actually have seen a bunch already, but they're disguised um, uh, throughout the talk. Okay, now let me just. Yes. Never 
Right. Okay. And okay. So now let's see some optimization problem, which is uh, some null cone problem, right? And this is our quintessential optimization problem: linear programming, right? So now suppose that I give you the vector space is now the set of all Laurent polynomials. And what are these polynomials? These are polynomials in the variables x1 up to xn, and also their inverses. So essentially, all the monomials are allowed to have negative integer exponents. Okay. And my action now is this torus group, the set of all diagonal matrices, and it acts by its scaling coordinates. OK? So here is the vector. Let me give you an example of a vector. Here is a vector. It's given by this polynomial, right? Um, x1, let's say, up to xn to the minus 1, and x2 to the cube, x3 minus 2. So this is a perfectly fine element of this vector space. And Yes, yeah, you can think of it as a vector of coefficients, but yeah, the monomials are like the, the vectors are indexed by these um, integer vectors, right? With negative exponents, possibly. So it's an infinite dimensional vector space. It's an infinite dimensional vector space, yes. But you can think of just like, I'm going to restrict to a particular set of monomials, and then you have a finite dimensional vector space, right? So, and your action is essentially so if you have uh, h1 up to hn, which belongs to the, to the torus group. Right? I act on my coordinates, like x1 up to xn, simply by scaling each coordinate appropriately. Right? And here, now let's fix our vector space. So suppose our vector space only has elements uh, w, like integer vectors, right? these exponents, uh, in, some set of, in some prescribed set omega. Okay? So think of it as the set of exponents or set of weights. And now, you, as Avi was saying, you can think of your polynomial as a vector with coefficient c omega, right? Um, and now, uh, well, yeah, and omega is the set as the support of q. Um, so it's these sets, these elements that we just described. And you can see that, so this null cone uh, is equivalent to linear programming because q is in the null cone. Remember, Q is in the null cone if and only if 0 is in the orbit closure, right? If and only if there's a scaling action that can drive this Q to 0, right? Um, and then this is in the null cone if and only if 0 is not in the convex hole of the support, right? And how can we, can, how can we see it? If you look at Farkas' lemma, right? So again, go more slowly. Uh -huh. What does it mean when you scale, you need to drive Q to 0? Right. So, um, No, no, the monomials won't cancel. The, I want to send it, all, all of the CWs, I want to send them to 0, right? So let me do the action for you here. So I have my sum of CW, and I have XW. Now, once I apply some group action, like H1 up to HN, once I act here, what happens, right? I'm going to take this guy to sum of CW, and now I have product of HI to the wi times xw. So the only way that I can drive this polynomial to 0 right, is if all of these guys go to 0. right? So And now, I'm just giving you one direction. But suppose that now you can look at the, the polytope. Oh, and we're looking at limits. It's not like It's limits. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, so hi needs to be 0. Yes, it's the orbit closure, exactly. That's why the, the, the closure is there. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so suppose that I have this triangle now, right? And let's say that the zero vector is in this orbit closure, right? Then there's no way that I, I mean, by Farkas lemma, right? Like if I take, let's say, any hyperplane and say, okay, everything above the hyperplane. Wait, what is this triangle? Oh, uh, this is that. Yeah, no, suppose that I have a polynomial with like three monomials, okay. right? So that like have W1, W2, W3. So these are the points like. W2. Yeah, because these are the coordinates. Yes. Yes. Okay. Good. Well, I, I do U V W. There we go. Right. So I have this polynomial. Now I have this polynomial that has like exponents U, V, and W. Right. If zero is outside of their convex hull. 
then what can I do? Right? I can find a separating hyperplane. Right? And then I can say, OK, well, on these guys, all are negative. Right? Or a 0 is in the hyperplane, actually. So 0 is in the hyperplane. And these guys are all negative. I mean, 0 doesn't need to be in the hyperplane, but zero. sorry, let me just put it here. I just find a separating hyperplane, which means that I can find an action, h, OK? And this action is only one parameter. I can say like t to the, t to the a1 or t to the an that encodes this hyperplane, such that these guys are all uh, less than 1. Ah, OK, so let me, let me do a one parameter action, right? So instead of doing a general action, I'm just going to do, yeah? Yeah, maybe you don't have to do online. Yeah. OK, yeah, so OK, OK, I, I can show this to you offline, maybe. Like, the, the proof is really simple. So if you have a. Yeah, so the statement is that uh, there exists some values of HI which drive this to 0. If and only if the. Yeah. OK, yeah, so I'll, I can explain later if you want to, but yes, uh, th that's the statement. Um, OK, so then, uh, OK, so we have the, this null cone problem. It essentially captures our linear programming problem, but for commutative groups, right? Because this, this torus group is commutative group. So we can generalize this to non-commutative groups. And the null cone problem can be seen as a non-commutative generalization of the linear programming. right? Uh, and we'll see more uh, about this problem. But let's talk about first non-commutative optimization now and like set up the what we're about to, to, to look, the general case. right? So the setup, again, is a group acting linearly on a vector space v. And then the capacity now is this optimization over the orbit closure, right? We talked about the null cone, which is like if 0 is in the orbit closure. Now let's define this optimization, which we call the capacity, OK? And we want to find the infimum over all elements of the group G of the norm of this new vector, G once I apply to V, OK? So and the null cone is when capacity is 0, right? And our norm minimization problem is this algorithmic problem now. So suppose that I give you v in a vector space and some parameter epsilon. And I also give the promise that the capacity of v is bigger than 0. So suppose that v is not in the null cone. Okay? The task now is for us to find an element of the group g such that you know, g is essentially 1 plus epsilon multiplicative approximation of the capacity. Right? So that, that's all this equation is saying. Right? Like that there's log log of this norm, of this element gv, is very close to the minimum norm. OK? So if the capacity was 0, I mean, this would be infinity, right? So that's why we just have this pr promise problem. And again, the null cone problem is, if I give you v in the vector space, is the capacity uh, equal to 0 or not, right? Um, and then you can ask the first question, well, can we efficiently solve this? Uh, norm minimization problem, right? So this problem is clearly non-convex. Uh, and the question one is, well, suppose that I have this promise problem. Can this promise problem solve the null cone problem, right? And the question is, for which epsilon would it be enough for me to distinguish if I'm in the null cone or not, right? Is there a gap between if I'm 0, I can go all the way to 0. If not, I won't go below some particular epsilon, OK? Huh? Well, because I mean, you can pick a point and rotate it local minimum, right? Like so, minimum is not unique, and they're not connected. Also, the domain is not complex. Also, the domain is. Right. Both the domain and the function are non-convex. Okay. Um, and since we're talking about convex, let's just define convexity, and let's see that this problem actually has a different kind of convexity. So. OK, in the Euclidean geometry, we know that the shortest path between A and B is given by a line, right? This is 
uh, in the Euclidean space that we're used to. And now we also know that a convex set is a set that for every two points in my set, the line between them is in the set, right? That's the definition of a convex set. And a convex function, uh, so a function is convex if it looks like this, right? If between any two points, the value is always under the, uh, under the line between them. And we love convexity, right? We have all these beautiful algorithms like ellipsoid, interior point methods, like Newton methods. Um, and we know how to do a lot of stuff uh, in this setting, right? To minimize a function. To minimize a convex function, yes. To minimize a convex function over a convex domain. This is also very important. Um, OK. But now, we'll, as we'll see in the second part of the talk, it turns out that this norm minimization problem, even though it's not convex when we talk about the usual Euclidean geometry, it is geodesically convex. It's, co it's convex in a more general way. OK? And what is this? Well, now the shortest path between A and B is given by geodesic, so an intuition is you know, like if you, if you're on Earth and you're gonna be, you're gonna go from P to Q, right? Like maybe fine from Brazil to Russia. I don't know. Like you would go like via that curve, right? You don't go through Earth. So through the ground, you go through Earth, of course, but you don't go through the ground. But um, okay. And a, what is a geodesically convex set? Now is that for every two points in your set, all their geodesics are in the set as well. Okay. Uh, and a geodesically convex function, well, is, you know, if you look at all, along each geodesic, that function has to be convex in the way that you used to. Okay? So the usual convexity. And geodesic just means shortest path. Shortest path, yeah, you can think of shortest path. Now, um, this is a more general setting, and here, like, very little is known compared to, like, what we know to the general convex optimization. If you want some literature, there's a book about, from Udistri and AMS and some work of, recent work of uh, Zhang and Suvrit Sra uh, and, and many others. You can see the references in there. Now, where do we see these geodesics? Well, we'll see that in the norm minimization problem is a geodesically convex problem, okay, with the geodesically convex domain and also the function is geodesically convex. And we'll see that in the second part of the talk. Uh, okay, now let's look at, at, our, at our log norm function. Again, so this is a function f. I can think of this function at a point v, f that I'm, I'm parameter, being parameterized by v and is a function from our group g to the space r, right? Uh, and for now, think of this function just as like matrix vector multiplication, OK? So we can take this log norm function, and we can just write this function as the log of you know, v, uh, gv dot uh, gv conjugate transpose, right? So now. Uh, if we look at this function, we can consider this function as being a function from the space P of the set of positive definite matrices, right? Because this matrix is always positive definite, and every time I'm acting, you know, you can think of it as I'm acting by this positive definite matrices. So it turns out that, you know, this set of positive definite matrices is a Riemannian manifold, um, and then it has its nice geodesics, okay? And so, the good directions here are given by this Hermitian matrices. Okay, so how do I go uh, from a point G along a direction H? I simply go from G and I take this exponential map, like e to the th uh, G, and then I move along. That's a geodesic. Okay, so all the geodesics going out of G, they take this form. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So what are you doing? You're saying instead of G, you're going to... Yeah, so you can embed, yeah, you can embed, like, simply just embed G into your space of positive definite matrices by this map. G maps to, like, this guy. Just the guy inside. Just the guy inside, yeah, the G transpose, yeah. And then you take the function, right, like... So G is a general... Think of, think of GLN. Yeah, I know you're gonna, you're from that crowd, but think of GLN. Then you're embedding it. Yeah, okay, so we have to do that again. Yeah, yeah, you, yes. Yeah, I don't want to add notation, so I just, yeah. Okay, so, and then uh, this, this geodesic along this path induces this, the nice geodesics in this positive definite space simply by taking, you go from G transpose G to G transpose E to the 2th G. 
Okay, so these actually happen to be geodesics into this Riemannian manifold with a specific metric. Okay, that's very well studied. Yeah, exactly. T is how much you're going to walk in, the, in that direction, exactly. Right? And H is like the direction that you're walking. Exactly. H is, the H, H is the direction, T is how far you're walking, exactly. And G is your starting point. Okay, so. But the space is as well dimensional, so basically a direction is specified by the matrix. Hermitian is good. Yeah, Hermitian is good in this case because, well, yeah, I mean. I, you, can you can take the polar decomposition and have the unitary in your Hermitian, right? But the unitary doesn't affect anything. So, like, we can mod out by the unitaries. So, okay. So, it turns out that this function is geodesically convex, okay? Um, I guess I'm not going to prove it, but it's, it's easy to see that this function is geodesically convex. Um, and the question two now is how well can we optimize these geodesically convex functions, okay? So uh, no, no, I said that if, if the for the capacity problem, right? They said that yeah. I don't know if you connected the log norm function to the previously defined norm function. Right? No, no, yeah, the norm minimization is about minimizing this function. Yeah, so you just took logs Yeah, no, I took logs before as well. Yes, yes. It's the same problem as before. It's the same problem. We're, we're, I'm, I'm going to stick with the same problem. Yeah, I try to do as little notation as possible. Um, yes, the same yeah, one function. We're only optimizing this function for now. Um, OK. Now, suppose that you believe me that this function is geodesically convex. Um, and then now, how do we optimize? It's like, OK, well, let's try to do gradient descent. But what is the gradient here? So the gradient is given by this function, this moment map, which you should think of as the gradient along the group action. Okay? So I have my function again, my log norm function, which I'm going to stick to for almost the rest of the talk. And the moment map here is the gradient of this function okay, along the group action when you take the gradient along at the identity. So as it is saying, like if you move a little bit away from the identity in any direction, right, like you, you get this gradient right, that dictates. Uh, how you move along this action. So, and what does what is the property of the gradient? Well, you have here that this is the derivative along the direction h, right? The side is the derivative along the direction h, and here, what does the gradient do? Well, the gradient inner product with your direction, right, should give you the derivative of the direction h. So, the moment map is this function at the point v that gives you the gradient uh, along the group action when you are like in this function f v. OK? Now, this measures how much the norm changes by the infinitesimal group action. OK? So, and what Kempfenes proved in 79 is that, remember, the capacity is bigger than 0. So what's the capacity? Is the infimum of this log norm function. So the capacity is bigger than 0 if and only if there is an element w in the orbit closure such that the gradient so the moment map evaluated at w, the, its norm is 0. So what does that mean? It means that the gradient of this function at w is equal to 0. Right? So this is, yeah? Sorry? Yes, I, I don't want to talk about the symplectic structure here. But yes, here you can just. Yeah, you don't need to talk about it. Any complex vector space has a natural symplectic structure. Right. And and this, if you think about it in terms of optimization, is essentially like, okay, I'm saying that a local minimum is a global minimum, right? Which is a characteristic of convex functions, right? So again, as we said that this function is convex, this is proving to you essentially that this function has some convexity property. Right? This is the kempf nast theorem in 79. They proved in a very general way. OK, so now uh, let's see what this moment map looks for our commutative action. Can you repeat the last thing? Yes. The ending of the last thing? Uh-huh. Yes. So, so what does the theorem mean again? So the theorem means that um, well, your capacity, remember, your capacity is, is bigger than 0, 
which means that there is a minimizer, right? Because if your capacity is zero, the log norm goes to minus infinity. So the capacity is zero if and only if there exists an element, w, in your orbit closure, such that this, the gradient at w is zero. Right? So the gradient of w is, is minimized. So you have gradient zero implies that you're a global minimizer. Yeah, that's what they show. Right, yep. So as Avi, yeah. There are a lot of slides that are later that are gonna say, but it's probably good to say no. Yeah, this is kind of non-commutative duality statement as Avi was saying. This certifies that your capacity is bigger than zero. And to certify the capacity is zero, you just drive it to zero. We just show here is a, a way of driving it to zero. Okay. So now let's see this moment map uh, in for commutative actions. So again, let's take the space of Laurent polynomials. And then uh, our group action by scaling coordinates, right? So again, here are my vectors. Here's my group action. Uh, OK, so my input now, I'm going to index every monomial by, this, by the vector, right, u of w. So you know that u of w is essentially this x to the w. Uh, so these are the basis of my vector space. And then I have a vector u. Now, this u w is the unit vector that corresponds to the monomial. Now, in this basis, um, we can see that if we compute the moment map here, the gradient, uh, what do we get? Right? So once we compute the moment map, we get this expression here, which I could do it in the board if you want, but maybe it's 11. OK, maybe I have 1030 to 1230, right? Yeah. Ah. Yeah, maybe, maybe let me do it, because it's nice for whoever wants to rest, they can rest. and. Everyone wants to watch. So, all right. So, what is our function? We have this function f v of h, right? Because we have our diagonal matrices h there, because we're in the torus. And what is this function? This is the function log of the norm of h when I apply to my vector vector u. Right? And this I can write. Is that V or F? Uh, oh, I have, do I have V there? Uh, Over here. V is the U. Oh, sorry, yes, this is U. Yeah, sorry, let me make this notation consistent. Yes, so it's U. And I mean, I can write this, since I can write U in that form, uh, all these UWs are unit vectors, and this is orthonormal basis, right? This U of Ws. So this log norm is essentially, OK, let me equals to the log of, well, let me take the square root away already. So let's think of this as the L2 norm. Um, so this is going to be the log of the sum of the absolute value of CW square. And I have my action. Remember my action? I multiply this U of W by H to the W, right? So this will be essentially product of i equals to 1 up to n of the norm of h i to the w i to the 2 w i. Right, so this is my function. And suppose I want to take the derivative at direction h. At direction, what is my direction? OK, y. Suppose that I have direction y given by y1 y2 up to yn, and I want to take derivative along this direction. What do I do? Right? So my infinitesimal action here will be, well, this is some element, but let me take the derivative again with respect to e, t, y. Right? So e, t, y1, yn. Right? So this is going to give me uh, the group action that I'm taking. And then now let me take the derivative. So now we know that the moment map, right? So if I have the moment map here of my group uh, Tn on this element u, inner product of y 
should be equal to my derivative at t equals to 0 of this norm function, right? Of f of u, and I take e to the ty, right? So let's take this derivative. OK, so the derivative here of this function, well, I can just replace this function by the a half, right? So I have a half of the derivative of the log of sum of cw squared. And then now my direction there is going to be e to the 2t. And I have now y inner product with w, right, for every w, right? Because this is only like e to the t yi uh, dot uh, wi, right? So this is 2y inner product with w. Now, once I take the derivative of log, what do I get? I get 1 over this expression, but it's 1 over this expression when t equals to 0, right? So it's essentially the norm of my vector, right? Because all of these are going to 0. So I have 1 over the sum of cw squared over all the elements in omega, right? So this is the norm of my vector, it's just uh, norm of u squared. And then now I have uh, the derivative of what's inside. Huh? Yeah, it's 1 over that. And then I have the derivative of what's inside, right? Times this derivative, which is sum over all w in omega of cw squared. What's the derivative of this guy? Right? I have y omega, and I have a 2 as well. Right? Because I evaluate it at 0. So I have the derivative. This pops up. And then this stays. This goes to 0. Right? Because I'm plugging in t equals to 0. So this is my derivative. But if you notice, I can rewrite this derivative right, as, well, this half cancels with this 2. And then I can rewrite my derivative as what? As y inner product with sum of over all w's of my norm, which is the norm of my vector u, cw squared, w. Right? So this is the vector that gives me the gradient. Right? And that's exactly the moment map. OK? Is that clear? OK, so now, uh, but as we can see, notice that. Um, over all the w's here. So my moment map, uh, this should be u, I'm sorry. So the moment map at u, if you look at it, you have that this is a convex combination of all of your weights w, right? Because once you sum over all the cw squares, you get exactly the v. So what it turns out is that this moment map, this vector, lies in the convex hull of your exponent vectors. Right? And this polytope has a name. And the name on this polytope is the Newton polytope, which is coming in a couple of slides. But um, as Avi you know, uh, saying, is like, so the moment map lies in the Newton polytope of your polynomial. OK? All the, uh, all the moment maps, right? You can take at any point uh, of this action, and you lie in this uh, polytope. So for every element in the orbit, right? Uh, and we wonder, is this a general phenomenon, right? Like, um, so now let's see how we get this magical convexity even uh, in the non-commutative case. So the setup now is I have my group G acting on a vector space. And again, we saw that the moment map is the gradient along the group action. Now let's see some examples of what is not going to work, right? So again, let's take the matrix vector multiplication action, right? So I have a matrix and I act on a space V. So OK, the action is, you know, the matrix G acts on V by multiplying on the left. And the, what is the moment map here? You know, a quick calculation will show that the moment map at the point G is going to be this matrix, right? Like V, V conjugate transpose over the norm of V. So these are rank one matrices. So this is clearly not a convex set, right? Because if I add two different rank one matrices, they're going to be a rank two matrix. So in this sense, the set of all moment maps themselves, they're not convex. But the magic happens 
when you take the set of eigenvalues of this moment map and put them in non-increasing order. OK? So if you take the set of eigenvalues with the spectra of your moment map, OK, and this, you put them in non-decreasing order, you get the set delta v, OK, which is the set of all the spectrum of all of your moment maps in an orbit closure. OK, so it turns out by a result of Kostan, Atia, Gilliman, Sternberg, uh, Ness and Manford, uh, Kirwan, and Brion, that this polytope is a convex polytope. Well, this set is a convex polytope. OK, there's a deep result, and it's a magical convexity that appears in these group actions. OK? But you just keep their spectra, exactly. What do you even mean the eigenvalues of the moment So usually, I mean, your moment map is going to be uh, some Hermitian matrix, right? Mm -hmm. So you just take the eigenvalues of the Hermitian matrix. Okay. What does that mean? Can you say something like, why, why would this be a good thing to do? Oh, I, it's magical to me, too, so. Um, uh, it's very natural. I mean, the, it's very natural to do. I mean, there is a non-convexity arises just because there is some group action on the on the set of moments that you can you really want to mod outside. And the group, group action that generates this non-convexity in a very simple way, and you have to just remove it. It's a very general. Uh, okay. It's general phenomenon. Are you just saying that the eigenvalue sorted removes the group action? Yeah. Remove, I think removes the unitary. Like the, I think the unitary problem that was, I think what I've been saying is that there's the unitary that makes things non-convex. There are two group actions you want to remove. You want to remove the unitary action, you want to remove the symmetric group. But that's in the unitary. No, you sort the eigenvalues. That's the sorting. That's the sorting. Removes the symmetric group. So basically, yeah, you, yeah, there are, it's just that the non-convexity in this particular example, there are also in general, arises from readings of the obvious because of some group action that you know, makes it non convex like the symmetric group, you know, we can take a convex set and make copies of it. Then they don't talk to each other, right? Each one is convex. So the, what it does, I mean, in this particular case, taking the eigenvalues, there is a general construction that just really remove the unitary or the maximum compact action, and you remove the symmetric group, or in this general, it's called the bias group. You remove or mod outside this action, and what remains is a uh, Always going to be convex. So yes. What remains is going to be convex. Convex polytope, yeah. Not just convex, polytope. Polytope. Yeah. The thing just what you really get is a bunch of convex polytopes that you want to say I want one. You just bought outside this action. In this particular group action that makes the best multiplication happens to be very simple. The gradient cell matrices, <laughs> Hermitian matrices in one. And once you mod out, just get, I mean, what's the mod out automatically, but if it's uh, natural, you, so you remove, either you, you just diagonalize, and then you sort them. These are the two things you remove, and then you are left with the convex matrix. Okay. It doesn't explain why the convex set is just. No, but it, ex it at least explains why you would even define this. Yes, okay. yes, yes. Okay. So. OK, and now, uh, why am I talking about this moment polytope? I mean, let's see the relation between this moment polytope and capacity, right? Uh, this norm minimization problem. So again, group G, now keep thinking of G always as like GLN acting on some vector space V. And we saw that the moment polytope is the set of eigenvalues, the spectra of the, of the moment maps in the orbit closure. And then now we have this moment polytope problem that we can think as well, right? So given a, uh, an element v in the vector space, this v defines some polytope, right? And suppose that I give you a target uh, spectra, uh, p is p in the moment polytope, right? This is a new problem. And um, well, how is this related to capacitor? Are we just defining a bunch of problem optimization problems here, right? I mean, this is a very natural optimization problem, but how is this related to capacity? Well, as it turns out, um, you know, if you think about it, if you have an element here whose moment map is 0, the spectra is going to be 0, right? 
So then it means that zero belongs to your moment polytope. So essentially, that condition of the gradient being zero can be replaced by zero being your moment polytope. So essentially, the null cone problem is a particular case of this moment polytope problem when this target point P is actually the zero spectrum. OK? And now you can go back to the linear program in that example where it's the moment polytope is linear to whatever. Exactly. And as Visu is pointing out, like in the linear programming set that we talk about the Newton polytope, the Newton polytope is exactly this moment polytope. Right? And this is the general linear programming question, right? I give you the polytope and I give you a point, and then I want to know if the point is in the polytope or not. Right? Okay. And our work, as we were going to see in the quantitative version of this non commutative duality, right? As Avi explained, this is some sort of non commutative duality. And our work, we give a quantitative version of it. Okay? Yes. That, yes, in, exactly. So, OK. So now, uh, but before I, I talk about the, um, all of our results, I need to define another problem, which is, as Avi is saying, is like this dual problem. We saw the norm minimization problem, which you can think is like a primal problem. I'm going to show you the dual problem of the norm minimization, which you already kind of saw based on the Kempf Ness, right? Which is this scaling problem. So the scaling problem is, now suppose I give you an input V. And I give you a point P in Rn, such that P is in my moment polytope. And again, I give you a target uh, approximation accuracy epsilon. What the goal is of the scaling problem is to find G such that my moment map, like the spectra of my moment map, minus P is less than epsilon. Right? So it approximates P as much as possible. Right? I, I can remove the spectrum because as Zavi is saying, there's all this permutation group and this unitary action that I can plug in here that if I can get the spectrum P, I can get moment map exactly with P, right? So OK. And this is the moment polytope problem uh, again, right? And well, again, the same question that we asked for the null cone, because remember, null cone is the moment polytope with P equals to 0, right? So the question for here is like, which epsilon solves membership in the moment polytope here? Right? That's another question that we're going to answer. Uh, and what Brion did is that so this is a dual problem right because if you think about it let's say suppose that p is equal to zero right by camp finesse right by certifying that i'm not in the null cone i just need to solve the scaling problem right if i find something greater than zero i show that i'm not in the null cone right so there is this primal and dual problem the norm minimization is the primal to this problem uh, and one really um, really beautiful fact by brion is that brion has this shifting trick that as we're going to see in the commutative case, let me just make a note on the commutative case, which I think I have a slide, but it's not now. Yes, it's not now. So let me make this remark now. I'll come back to this remark later. So if you think about it, in the commutative case, suppose that I give it the Newton polytope, and I ask, like, oh, is P in the Newton polytope? What we can do is, well, we can sh simply uh, reduce this question to like 0 being the, in, in the polytope, because we can shift the polytope by P. Right? And I can ask, oh, in this new polytope, is 0 in this new polytope? But now I have this non-commutative group action. And the question is, can I reduce this moment polytope problem with p there to like the 0, like to p equals to 0, right? to a null cone problem? And the answer here is yes. And Brion in 1987 uh, developed this shifting trick to reduce this moment polytope problem uh, to, again, um, to, again, a norm minimization problem. Because if I reduce this uh, moment polytope problem, like p in the moment polytope to 0 in the moment polytope, remember, I have this dual problem, which is the norm minimization. Right? So what Brion did is, well, you know, we can actually shift. Like, you can convert this problem with general p to just saying 0 is in some other moment polytope. OK? So it's a different moment polytope. So what she did was she converted this. And by converting to another, like zero in some other moment polytope, you can try to solve it using this optimization problem that we have, this capacity problem as well. Oh, it's a you have sub -P, sub -P. Yes, I have a sub p. Is a different, yeah, is a different capacity because I have a different polytope here as well. So the polytope, again, the Newton polytope is very simple. You just shift the whole thing. 
Here, the action is a little bit more involved, quite a bit more involved. Okay, so then, you know, we also have an effective algorithm for this new capacity, for this capacity with P here, which is a different problem, which I'll, I'll talk about a little bit in the end of the talk. Okay, so now let me give you some examples of moment polytopes, one of which, which you already saw, for example, the Newton polytope, which is the convex hull of exponent vectors, uh, you already saw is a moment polytope, right? Um, yes, 11.30 I'm playing in the break, yes. Um, yeah, so we have the, the Newton polytope is an example of polytope. Another moment polytope is the Schurhorn polytope, which is the set of diagonals of similar matrices. Okay, so this is the group action. I have the, symmetric, the space of symmetric matrices, and then G acts by conjugation, and then the polytope is the set of diagonals of all the similar matrices to A. Okay, this is also a moment polytope. Um, another famous polytope. Yes. Yeah, that's. <laughs> and again, we have also a horn polytope, which is, remember, one of the first problems that we had this uh, eigenvalues of sums of matrices. So the sum of all of these eigenvalues, these tuples, such that there exists matrices that sum with the prescribed eigenvalues. This is also a polytope. And then we have the Edmonds polytope, which is matroid intersection. And uh, all right. I'm, I'm really good on time. I just have one more slide and then we take a break. So, yeah. Um, okay, so let's go back to our uh, unexpected applications, right? So we had the algebraic identities and we have quantum information theory. We have the analytic inequalities and we have eigenvalues of sums of Hermitian matrix. In the beginning, I said to you that they were all examples of non-commutative optimization problems, right? Now, the first one is a null cone problem. Okay, it's a disguised null cone problem. That's in the beginning of our work in 2016, 15. Quantum information problem is this one qu body quantum marginal problem is a moment polytope. Okay, the marginals are the, the target point that you want to achieve. Uh, this brass camp lee problem, when we solve it, we solved it by converting it to a null, po null cone problem. But it turns out that like it's best seen as like a linear projection of a uh, moment polytope problem. Okay, but remember, the null cone is simply because you can convert moment polytope to null cone. So when we solved it, we were thinking of this null cone problem, but then really this analytic inequality is a moment polytope problem. And this problem, as we saw, well, we just saw in the previous slide that this comes from a moment polytope, right? So figuring out if there are matrices A, B, C. Now let's talk about uh, a little bit more about our results uh, and a little bit about the algorithms that, that we come up. So these are going to be first and second order methods. So it's a gradient descent and a second order uh, Newton method. And we're going to describe the main parameters that govern these algorithms. We're going to see some examples of them in the, non in the commutative case. Uh, and then we're going to talk about a little bit of the non-commutative duality that uh, we, talked, we saw in the first talk. And, and then we're going to talk some open questions, okay? So just a quick recap, um, right? So what is our function? We have this log norm function, right? This fv, which is equal to the log, which is a function from the group to the reals, that there's fv of g is the log norm of the norm of g action of v, right? And again, we saw that this function is a function from the positive, can be seen as a function of the positive definite matrices. And we have this nice geodesics. This function is geodesically convex. Right, and what we want to know now is how we can optimize over these functions, right? Okay, so um, when we talk about convexity, we have all these other things for algorithms like smoothness and self-concordance and so on, and let's see what happens in the setting of geodesic convexity, right? So in convexity, we say that a function is convex if the second derivative is non-negative for all your inputs, right? And a function, a multivariate function, is convex if it's convex along each line. And in geodesic convexity, we do the same, right? We say that this function is geodesically convex if it's convex along each geodesic, okay? Just simple, okay? So again, we have, what does that mean? That means that the second order derivative along each geodesic gamma, right, given by this eth dot g, is greater than or equal to zero, okay, for all geodesics. Okay, now, uh, we also have this other parameter, which is the smoothness. 
and a function is smooth, if you can think, if you think about it, is that if the second order derivative is not that large, okay, it's always smaller than L. Okay, so you're convex, but you're always smaller, you're bounded by a constant, okay? So it's L smooth if your second order derivative is always bounded by a constant. Uh, and now we're going to say that a function is geodesically smooth with parameter L if it's smooth along, ge along each geodesic, which means what? Again, I take the second order derivative, okay? It is bigger than zero, but it's also less than or equal than L times, you know, the norm of your direction, right? You just have to account for it. But think of it as H always having norm one, and then you have the same definition of smoothness. Okay? Yes, this generalizes this definition of smoothness. You can yes. think of this Hessian as saying all lines. Along all lines. You can think along all lines, your directional derivative is bounded by L. Okay, why is that Oh, no. This is an optimization definition of smoothness. I see. Okay, I'm not going to go towards it. I mean, your, this function will be smooth as well, but like. Because you have the derivative, I mean, but it's smooth doesn't mean that in your sense that it has like infinitely many derivatives or whatever. Like here, all we carry in optimization is the second order derivative is bounded. Is a different yes. Sorry, I have to parse you now because you may be putting words in my slides. Um, okay, so um, yeah, so smooth is only about the second order derivative. Second order derivative along each line is bounded, right? Geodesically smooth is bounded along each geodesic. Okay. Now, it turns out that our log norm is smooth, as we're going to see soon. Okay? So can we efficiently optimize geodesically uh, smooth functions? And the answer is yes. We're just going to use gradient descent. Okay? And we're pretty much going to generalize that uh, textbook analysis of the gradient descent to the geodesic setting. Did you already define L smooth? So when you say log norm is smooth? Is, yeah, L smooth. For some L. L. L is the parameter in your algorithm, right? It's the step size that you take in the gradient descent, like 1 over L. So the bottom line, if you have a smooth function, smooth in this sense, like uh, a convex function, you can optimize using. Smooth just means there exists an L. There exists an L, and we're going to find the L, yes. And it affects your runtime. And it affects your runtime. How? Yes. Yeah, we're going to, yeah, I'll, I'll show the algorithm here, and it will see how to optimize this. Yeah, but essentially, if I say it's smooth, there is some L, and you find the L, the better, the lower the L, the faster your algorithm runs. So when you say first order algorithm, you mean the gradient is first order? Yes, gradient descent is the first, the canonical first order algorithm, yeah. All right, and now uh, let's talk a bit about self-concordance, which is a little less familiar. And I don't know if you ever Google self-concordance, but if you Google it, you get this, right? Self-concordance refers to an optimal mode of goal striving in which an individual has an innate interest or value-based identification with their goal, right? Self-concordance enables a person not only to achieve their goals, but also to satisfy their need for autonomy, competence, and so on. Uh, and it, it has been observed to have benefits in academic, occupational, and cross-cultural settings, right? So this is the definition you find, but if you know you're talking about self-concordant functions, there's a different business, right? But it's still aligned with your goals, and it has it has shown to have benefits in the academic setting. So we're going to see those now, right? So the self-concordant function, uh, which is de uh, defined by Nesterov uh, and Emirovsky, is so function f is self-concordant if the third-order derivative, okay, uh, is upper bounded by this parameter r times the second order derivative, and I have to have the 3 over 2 there to make this definition scale invariant. Okay? R is a constant or it's a function? R is a constant. Yeah, sorry. R, yeah, this is, I should have put a dot here. Yes, R is a constant, is your parameter, and then this is the second order derivative uh, to the power 3 halves. Okay? So, and then we say that if a function, a multivariate function, is self-concordant, again, if it's self-concordant along each line. Okay, and 
we're going to say that a function is geodesically self-concordant if it's self-concordant along each geodesic. That's the usual story, right? How you generalize. Let's see some examples. So f, this function f, like minus log of x is the quintessential um, self-concordant function. Um, and I think the parameter is even 1 or maybe 2. Uh, and then if you have a function in the space of PSD matrices, okay, like the Euclidean space, if you, the PSD matrices, um, here, this function that log that minus log that of x on the positive uh, definite uh, point, this point is, this function is also self-concordant, okay? So, yeah, no, there, there's some r and people prove the r. The r is small, like it's not super big, yeah. Um, it's like some constant r that they find. I think here the r is 2, if I'm not mistaken. Just do that one, it be easier. Yeah, we can do it later, yeah. Because now, now I have to, yeah. Um, yes. <laughs> so, and the observation here is that the self concordance function, because we have that three halves, this is, is scaling variant, this is a scaling variant definition, right? So, you know, I can multiply my input by t, and this, this does not change. And this is great for Newton's method as by this work of Nesterov and Amirovsky. Now, a bad news is that log norm is not self-concordant. Yeah, that's, that's bad news. Um, Still, I mean, you have such a nice Google definition of self-concordance. You said something that you align with your own goals. Does that have anything to do with this definition? No, I mean, we're not as aligned. I'm just saying that this, we're not as aligned to our goals. as. No, oh. That, that original self concordant no, that was a joke. Yeah, yeah. So what is your goal and what can you explain? It's optimization. The goal is optimization and moving the other one. And why would you want your third derivative to be bounded by your second derivative? Oh, it's because... It, it's, it's because... Yeah, I mean, the before and you did complain the smoothness wanted to bound the second derivative by some point. No, you so, wanted to bound the second derivative, not by the first derivative. Well, I mean, you... you yeah, so here, yeah, so here all... all Okay, so why would you want, I think the question, why would you want your function to be self-concordant, right? So, and what Nesterov and Demirovsky show is that if your function is self-concordant, essentially you can approximate your function, like in, if you're far from the optimum, you can approximate like in a very big space by a quadratic function, which you know how to optimize. So you can just optimize and take a large step in these interior point methods, right? So they developed this, all these interior point method machinery and this Newton, like second order method. Uh, for self-concordant functions. So then they can give you efficient algorithms. That was their purpose of the self-concordance uh, helps you achieve this goal because if your function is self-concordant, it looks essentially like a big quadratic function. And then you can optimize. Because it means essentially you should think of this as like my third derivative is very small compared to my second order derivative. Just taking the Taylor series of your function, right? This allows you to truncate it at the second second point. You yeah, you truncated the second order. The rest is small, and you have a quadratic function to minimize it. Really, the nicest function you can. And I'm supposed to understand the three halves somehow, or? No, no, we don't have. Yeah, we don't have. It's, yeah, you, it, yeah. You, this is a scale invariant. You just really want that uh, the magnitude of the remaining term relates to the magnitude of the second term in the appropriate way. That's why the three halves. These are the powers that appear in the. Yeah, so if you take the Taylor series, like it, it, this will give you exactly that you can approximate by the quadratic function, and you don't lose much on the rest. Yeah. So remember, like when you do Taylor series and say, I'm going to truncate this because everything else is small, this condition is telling you exactly that how much you're going to lose when you approximate. Sorry, yeah, maybe. So really, I should understand this as saying, I want my function to be a quadratic. Here is some technical way to exactly. approximate it by a quadratic. Perfect. Yeah, that's, that's the way to. And how far you can Yes, and how far can I make this approximation? Yeah, I mean, in this case, yes. No, in this case, in this case no. In this case, because it's a scaling variant, it doesn't depend on the R. R just depends on, R just tells you the quality of your approximation. Yeah, because it's a scaling variant, that's the whole point. You can take big steps, you can approximate this very globally, kind of, in a sense. Yeah, self-concordance tells you that, like, this is kind of like a gigantic quadratic function. It just looks more complicated, but in essence, it's a quadratic function plus some error. And the error is captured by this R. Globally, yeah, it's globally, exactly. It's globally a quadratic function. OK, but we do not have this. right? We're not as aligned with our goals as we thought. 
Now, can we relax the self-concordance and still optimize well, right? And this is, you know, some people study this in the literature in, in the commutative case. There's this trust region methods, which are second order methods. And we are going to have a geodesic analog of these, OK? That's also part of our generalization. And we'll see this algorithm as well later. Now, let's see what is this uh, relaxed notion of self-concordance. What is this notion that we need? Now, remember that in self-concordance, we had that the third order derivative was bounded by this r times this second derivative to the 3 halves. And that was a scaling variant. Now I'm going to drop this scaling variant condition. Okay? And I'm just going to ask if my function is self-robust if this holds. Okay? I drop this scaling variant condition, which means I'm not going to globally look like a quadratic, but you know. Uh, let's see. This will at least give us something. Right? Uh, and then we say that this function is self-robust if the third order is bounded uh, above by r, this parameter r, which is a global, like a constant, think of r as a constant, or derivative. Again, multivariate if it's self-robust, if it's self-robust along each line, and the geodesic is the same story, right? So all of this is saying is that, again, my third order derivative is bounded above by r. You can think of this as 1 and my second order um, derivative for all geodesics, right? Let's see some examples of, so essentially this function now, remember we talked about, we had this whole discussion in the previous slide that self-concordance gives you globally quadratic. This only looks locally quadratic. I cannot take big steps because I don't have that scaling variant, okay? Now, this lo looks locally quadratic and what are some examples of self-robust functions? The quintessential example you should think of is an exponential function, right? So if I take, I mean, this, you can even take the derivative now and see, right? Like, <laughs> every time you take a derivative, you just pop an r here, and then you have the r there, OK? Now, and it turns out that, actually, our log norm function is also self-robust, OK? With a very small parameter, and a parameter depends on the representation theory of the group action, which are, we're going to see later, OK? So this function is also self-robust. So excuse me. Yeah. In classical optimization, how do we optimize self-robust? You're going to see soon. Oh, okay. Yes. But it's essentially you look at a small ball, and then you say, OK, around this small ball, it looks like a quadratic function. I know how to solve this quadratic function. I solve, I find the maximum. I found the other optimum. I look at a small ball around that new point, and I keep minimizing. Well, this ball is one of Yes. OK, so the log norm is self-robust. And now the question is, can we efficiently optimize the self-robust functions? As we saw, this is a second order methods, this trust region that we're going to see soon. And this algorithm that we're going to give now, it just generalizes this robustness from this matrix and operator scaling. This, math, this notion of robustness was developed in this op matrix and operator scaling. Um, and we're going to generalize this to all of these group actions, OK? OK, now let's see the first order algorithm. Okay, let's see this gradient descent, right? It's just geodesic first order algorithm. So if we have our input is our function, remember, from the positive definite to the reals. Suppose that this function is L smooth. Like, this function does not need to be the log norm. But if you want to put the log norm there, it's fine. Put the log norm here, and this becomes the moment map. OK, so we have a function which is L smooth. And we have access to the gradient of this function along the group action, which is the moment map. For, for the log norm is the moment map. Uh, and we want to find this approximate minimizer, right? We want to find this g such that you know, the norm of the moment map is less than or equal to epsilon. OK, so how do we do it? Well, how does the um, gradient descent work? We start at some point, And here, we're just going to start at the identity. OK, and our step size is going to be 1 over smoothness parameter. OK, this is just how the gradient descent algorithm would work. And I run by this many steps. Like This is the distance from my function to the minimizer. And I'm going to pay this um, my smoothness over epsilon square. OK, so now you can see how you pay depending on the L. If the L is bad, your runtime is bigger. Uh, OK, and now, you know, for t, 
equals to zero up to that uh, final time, you just get uh, the new point by saying, okay, take my uh, my current point, my current group, like point in the group, like let's say I started the identity, and my new point I'm going to update by taking a step of size eta, right, of step size in the gradient, following the gradient, which is the moment map. Okay, that's how the first order algorithm works, and we just do this algorithm. And then in the end, you return the G among all your list, which minimizes your function. Okay? Ah, uh, well, okay. So I mean, the, the gradient lives in, in the Lie in the Lie algebra of the group. So here it'll be like the Hermitian matrices, right? So this set of G's here will be like a bunch of Hermitian matrices. So not G. Well, uh, well, no. This this step like this lives in the in the Lie algebra and this lives in the Lie group, right? So then you just return, but then you just need to compute. I mean, these guys they are group elements, right? So you just output. You just pick G I apply to your vector v and check the norm. And then in the end, you just want to see which one minimizes the norm or which one minimizes the gradient right? by that duality. How do you compute the expansion? Huh? How do you compute the expansion? We are approximate. So all of this has approximations, right? Yeah. Um, OK, now the question is, how smooth are the scaling problems, like this log norm problems that, that, that I talked about, right? Because that's going to tell us if the algorithm runs well or not, right? And what is, let's say, even if we talk about operator scaling, um, which some of you may know, so what is the bound, for example, for this uh, smoothness in the left right action for the matrix scaling? So the bound is 2, okay? So it's very good, right? And what is the bound for log capacity? Uh, because we also need the distance from our current point to the minimizer, right? So, and what is the bound for the f minimum here? So if I had log norm, I would have the log capacity. And, and then we showed in 2015 that this bound is less than or equal to polynomial. Okay, so we have, so this running time here is polynomial in n, and this l is 2. So gradient descent here, we're running polynomial time, and we get a... Yeah, so I feel like I'm, I'm lost. So sure. Yes, I think I have that uh, even for the commutative setting. So let me see if I have it here. Maybe we want to see it in some non commutative setting. Oh, oh but then. I, uh, yeah, I can. But I have to compute the gradient. That's the problem, right? Okay, then maybe just say it. Uh, can you say it without doing any calculation? Just yeah, so okay, let me, yeah, without doing any calculations, let me, so suppose that, so. There were several definitions, and uh, maybe I forgot some of them already, so. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. yeah, so if I had, suppose, suppose, yeah, suppose that I had the operator scaling here, right? So I have a tuple of matrices, and I'm allowed to multiply on the, on the left and on the right, right? Each of them, simu all this tuple simultaneously by one matrix on the left and one on the right. And your goal is to. And, and the goal is to find, like, the minimum norm, or to find, like this condition here, actually, for the operator scaling becomes if, you're, if the, the tuple is close to doubly stochastic or not, okay. right? So you want to figure out in the end, like this gradient being less than epsilon, it turns out that the gradient is exactly the doubly stochastic conditions. Yeah, so can you explain that? That would yeah, be that a matrix gradient. It's a commutative yeah. case, but it's the OK, can, yeah. So can you explain that again? The matrix scaling. Yeah. Right, so if I had matrix scaling, yeah. right? So it turns out that if I take the, the moment map of the matrix scaling, that's exactly the distance of how far your rows are from being doubly stochastic and how far your columns are from being doubly stochastic. Okay, okay? so this would be like your, the distance from being doubly stochastic is this norm, okay? And if I wanna get epsilon close to doubly stochastic, I wanna have this gradient less than or equal to epsilon. And then here, now I'm going to do the scaling, right? So if you remember like the LSW algorithm or like this Sinkhorn's algorithm, what does he do? Let's say he minimizes first like how close the rows are, right? And then minimizes the column. This you can think of like as a block gradient descent. It's like, oh, I'm minimizing this part of the gradient and then I minimize the other part of the gradient. What this algorithm will do 
is different, right? Instead of minimizing, like fixing one and minimizing the other, just minimize both of them at the same time. So then here, you start at, with your current matrix. So you're, you don't scale the rows or the columns at all, right? You have your smoothness, which is small, and you have this parameter t. We can forget about all of these things. Now, what is the algorithm going to do here? I start with my matrix, and I have my distance from uh, my row distance from w stochastic and my column distance to w stochastic, right? Now, what am I going to do? I'm going to compute. I, I have this gradient, right? Like my, my distance to w stochastic, like the if I have so in the matrix scaling case, it turns out that this gradient is exactly uh, like all of these guys, right, up to n, and also like. This, this 2n vector, right? The vector of all the row differences and the column differences, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, so this is my gradient, right? I have this two, like, this belongs to like 2n two, two parameters, right? And then now, so if at your current matrix, you look at this parameter here. This is your gradient. So now what you're going to do is you're going to, the, the scaling process, like so G1, which is the first scaling, okay? What you're going to do is your G1 is going to be exactly like, um, well, your matrix would come here, right? But your group element is this matrix, is the two matrices, right? It's the row and the columns. And it would be like E to the, some small step, right? Like minus eta times like R1, minus 1 over n. And then here is going to be e to the minus eta, like c1 minus 1 over n, and so on. This is your first step. Once you took the first step, you look at your matrix again. And then you compute your gradient, which in this case is very simple. And then you keep updating. Yeah, no problem. And then you just pick the one that minimizes the distance. Yes. Okay. Okay. That's very good. Um, okay. Now let's talk about this smoothness and robustness of a group action. Well, how, how can we compute these? So I give you a group acting in a vector space. How can I compute the smoothness and robustness, right? So, okay. Again, the setup is we have a group G acting linearly in the vector space. Okay. So it's given by this representation pi, right? Which is the embedding of G. Like let's say you have GLN into a bigger like space of matrices, right? So now we're going to take the set of weights of this action, which is this omega. Remember, so if you think about that polynomial uh, action, the Laurent polynomials, like the Newton polytope action, remember that I said that the vertices, like the, the your monomials, are these elements W, and the set of your monomials gives you the set of omega. This is exactly the set of weights for this representation. Okay, and you should think of these weights as eigenvalues of this commutative action, because if you remember uh, from the commutative action, once I had my polynomial u, I wrote it as like c w times this vector u w. What was the action, right? Like if I acted by h one up to h n, right? It will just take this u w to product of h i w i to the u w. Right, so this vector here is essentially an eigenvector of this uh, torus action, right? So the weights are these eigenvalues of this maximum commutative action. And one of the definitions of our is this weight norm. Okay, and what is this weight norm? It turns out that this weight norm captures the smoothness and robustness. And if I give you a representation pi, what you do is look at this torus that sits inside, or like the maximum commutative action, okay? Look at the stores. Get all the weights. So you're going to get all of these eigenvalues, all of these vectors w. And now the weight norm is essentially the maximum L2 norm of these weights. Okay. It turns out, I mean, this has correspondence to the Lie algebra, but I'm not going to talk about it here because uh, we don't have a lot of time. 
But what we prove is that the log norm function for any group action is 2 times n pi squared is smooth. So if you take your group action, if you only look at your group action, you can compute this very easily, okay? this weight norm. And it turns out that once you have this weight norm, the log norm function is this much smooth. So if your weight norm is small, it means your function is very smooth. Okay? And also, this parameter governs the robustness. Because if you have this n pi, the log norm function is 4n robust. Okay? So essentially, your group action already gives you how robust and how smooth your log norm function will be. Okay? So if this parameter is small and your distance to the optimum is small, then gradient descent will do just fine for you. Okay? If you can afford the 1 over epsilon. Yes. Yeah. And th yeah, this holds regardless of being commutative or non commutative. You just go to the maximum, as Avi was saying, the maximum commutative action. You're going to get these weights exactly as eigenvectors. And these are the, the, the weights. Um, OK. Now, let's see how to get weights from a group action, right? So, for example, let me just show you for, as, as you wanted, a non commutative action. Let's see how to get weights for for some representation, right? So suppose that I have the GLN acting by conjugation on the space of matrices. Let's just see how to get the weights for this non-commutative matrix, right? So OK, what is the maximal commutative subgroup of GLN? You have this torus, right? Just the diagonal matrices. All the diagonal matrices invertible. This is the maximal commutative subgroup. So we have this group. And now all we want to know is we want to find all the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of this action, right? Of this action V. Remember, our v is a space of dimension n squared. So we have to have like n squared eigenvalues, right? So what are the eigenvectors? Well, let's look at the action of my conjugation group, h1 up to hn, on the you know, elementary matrix, the one that has only 1 in the entry ij and 0 everywhere else. We have n squared of those, so this is great. And if you see it, the action of the group takes eij to itself multiplied by this, hi, hj minus 1. Right? So remember that the weights are these exponents of, the, of these guys. So my weight here is 1 on the entry EI and minus 1 on the entry EJ. Right? So what is my weight vector here? So my set of weights is going to be all these differences between the standard vectors, like EI minus EJ. Right? This is the weight vector corresponding to this eigenvector. Okay? Given the group, here's how to get the weights. Right? So in the weight norm, well, we have the maximum norm of these guys is square root 2. Yeah, for i equals j, it's just 1. Huh? For i equals j. Yeah, for i equals j, is just 1. Yeah. OK, so as a consequence, the log norm. The, weight the weight is 0, exactly. Yeah, so I just, yes. Yeah, I forgot to add the 0 there, but yeah. Uh, so as a consequence, the log norm function is 4 smooth. Right, because it had like uh, 2n squared. And then the log norm function is for like n, which is root 2 robust. So it's very smooth and very robust for this setting, right? So in the setting, we're golden and we can okay. use. Exactly, yes. Exactly. This is the gradient descent to test exactly new potency. Yes. OK. Now we know how to get weights. Now let's talk about the second order methods. And maybe we're going to uh, maybe mention a little bit how it works in the matrix scaling, because I think it was a very good, um, very good exercise. So now um, let's talk about second order methods, right? This trust region methods, that now we know that our function is robust. So locally, in a small ball, it looks like a quadratic function, right? So we need to just know how to optimize there. So now again, I give you a function f, which is the log norm. You can think about it. And 
which is R robust. And I, give, I need to give you a bound on initial distance d to the optimum, right? Because I mean, I, I need to know that I have a solution where I'm looking for, right? So I give you this bound d on the distance. Now what we want to do is we want to find uh, an approximate minimizer, right? So if you had the log norm, you want to find some element, some group element g, such that the norm of this new vector is less than the capacity plus some epsilon, right? Log of the capacity. So here's our algorithm. Again, I start at the identity. So like, it, suppose we can try to do that for matrix scaling again, right? You take your matrix that you're going to try to scale to double stochastic. You start with that matrix, which means that your G0 is equal to identity. And the running time here just depends on the robustness, the distance to the optimum that you are, and you know, log of the distance to the optimum over epsilon. OK? Log, log of, the, of the difference between the value of your function. So OK. And now you just run. So we're going to look at our function, our current function, where we are. So like, in a sense, if you're a matrix scaling, you're just going to look at the matrix around the identity. right? So this is the identity. And you look at your original matrix. What is your first step? Right? Your first step is to approximate the norm, the norm of your matrix. right? Because remember, this function is the log norm. So we're going to approximate the log norm by a quadratic. So you take the Taylor expansion, take the quadratic approximation. Okay, And now you find the direction which minimizes your quadratic function. So you're, you have your matrix. And in that matrix, you look at the norm, and you approximate by a quadratic. Now minimize this quadratic function and go to that point. So h is this new point that you go to, is the new direction that takes you to that point. right? And then what you do is you take your new group action, which is your scaling. right? Like, so now you have to take the scaling that takes you to the new point. Okay? So you use this minimizer to go to the new point. Okay? Forget uh, this is some technicality, but it doesn't matter much. And then you repeat. right? Since you're always minimizing, I mean, you're always decreasing the value of the norm function. So you don't need to look at all the values and like, check. You're always minimizing, right? So then, in the end, you return uh, the last guy. And this guy will be an epsilon minimizer. OK? Now, can we get general bounds? I mean, to analyze this algorithm, all the, sorry, the trust. Yeah. Sorry, yes. Thank you, Avi. Yeah, so the trust region is. You know, a ball of radius like 1 over r around my current point. right? So that's how the, the robustness parameter enters as well. And because I'm only taking these many steps, right, the r is going to enter here. Uh, good. And now, can we get general bounds on the robustness and on the diameter right? and on the capacity as well? right? Because this is the capacity bound. Um, so I mean, we saw how to get bounds on the robustness. It's really easy. You give in the group, you can just get the robustness based on the weights. Now we need to talk about the bound on the distance to the optimum, right? Like this diameter bound. And you know, in 2018, for the left-right action, we gave polynomial bounds for like the distance, the robustness for the left-right action. Um, yeah, and now, but let's see now a general way of trying to recover this um, distance to the optimum bound. Yeah, and we'll see again that this distance only depends on the weights that we saw again. Okay, So the diameter bounds for a group action. So again, we have my group G, and I have this representation pi. We saw the set of weights, and we saw that there are eigenvalues of the maximum commutative action. Right. So, so far, so good. Now, we have this definition of the weight margin. And what is the weight margin? We should stop here for a bit, and is the following. Suppose that I look at my moment polytope. Right? And I look at all the points of my weights. Now, what I'm interested in, I'm interested in all of the subsets of these weights that I have, such that 0 is outside of the set of weights. The convex hull, the convex hull of these weights. OK? So look at all these subsets. And then this parameter, the weight margin, this gamma, is the minimum distance between 0 and the convex hull of the set. Okay, when you range over all the sets. So take all the sets whose convex hull does not contain 0. Take the distance from 0 to the set. Now take the minimum of these distances. Okay, this is our weight margin. Okay? But these are kind of bad cases, right? Because if you're, 
If your polytope is like very close to zero, Uh, no, no, it, it's just because you're trying to define, let's say if you're trying to solve like the null cone or something, right? Like you're trying to figure out if something is zero or not. So if you pick an input whose weight vectors, like whose subsets of these weights, like they, the zero is very close, this is going to affect capacity and this affects all. Like this essentially tells you that you can be, you have to go very close to zero to certify that you're zero, yeah. essentially, okay? No, because you get yeah, because this is essentially a worst case analysis, right? In the worst case, you have to see like what is the set of points that I have to go really, like really close to zero to certify that I'm zero or not, right? This is what the weight margin is kind of telling you. So, you know, the weight margin is used to obtain diameter bounds for the law for the capacity optimization, and it also appears in then non-commutative duality as we're going to see soon. Okay, so I'm just going to make this remark. But before I keep going, let me just tell you what the bounds that we know for robustness and weight margins in general. Okay, so what are the bounds that we can get for the weight margin and this weight norm, right? Like, so this gamma and the n pi that we saw. So again, we have this group action uh, given this representation. For matrix scaling, uh, Linia, Samorodinsky, and, and Wigderson, they proved uh, upper bound on the weight margin of n to the minus 3 halves. So, okay, our bounds depend on one over the weight margin. So you should think of if the weight margin is big, is good, because our upper bounds depend on the inverse of that. So we always want a good weight margin is a big weight margin. If it's really small, it's bad, right? So for matrix scaling, we have an, a, a lower bound, which shows that the weight margin is very big, which is good, and the weight norm is square root two, right? For simultaneous conjugation, um, we saw one example, right, like a very simple one. We ha only have one matrix, but you can see, so the weight margin here uh, that we show in our paper is greater than n to the minus 3 halves as well, and the weight norm is square root 2, okay? Uh, now, for operator scaling, Gurvitz in 2004 already proved that the weight margin here is actually omega to the uh, n to the minus 3 halves, uh, and the weight norm is root 2, but, you know, you, can, you should see that the left-right action and the matrix scaling, they're the same because they have the same weights, okay? It's just an observation, but you don't need to follow this. Now, for tensor scaling, which is the setting that, suppose in, you have the matrix scaling, now I have a tensor. And now I'm allowed to, to scale every facet of this tensor in all of the three directions, okay? That's the tensor scaling problem. So in the tensor scaling, implicit in the work of Kravitzov, is an upper bound on the weight margin but an exponentially small upper bound, which means that for this case, the weight margin is really bad. This is for three tensors. This is for three tensors, yes. And the weight norm is root three. And what we prove in our paper uh, is a general bound. So if you have a polynomial representation, okay, where, you know, of degree d, so this general bound is the weight margin is lower bounded by this inverse exponential. So it's a terrible bound. But you can see why it's terrible, because we're also like lower bound this weight margin. So it has to be terrible in general, right? And the weight norm there is small, is the degree of her. No, but Abby says that exponential is. But exponential is terrible, but it's good. It's yes. compared to other algorithms, it can be doubly, doubly exponential. Yeah. Yes. This is the degree, like, so pi will map, like, every entry of the GLV here is going to be a polynomial of degree d in the entries of your group. Yeah. Okay, so these are some bounds that we can get. Uh, but again, if you have good bounds uh, for any of your action, you have efficient algorithms, right, given the first and second order. That's the punchline. Uh, now, let's see this quantitative non-commutative duality, which will tell us how the scaling problem that, like, that minimizing the gradient relates to minimizing the log norm, right? So our theorem is, you know, if you have your group G acting on vector space V, so if you take any non-zero vector V, we have the following uh, statement, okay? So, and this 
is how close you are to the minimizer. Right? You can think of this is the minimum norm in your orbit closure, and this is your current norm. Right? So this is the ratio between your, the minimum norm of your problem to your current norm. Right? So this is lower bounded by some quantity. I mean, you don't need to read the equations much, but this quantity depends on you know, the norm of the moment map, the norm of your gradient at your point right now over the weight margin. So remember, the weight margin comes here in this non-commutative duality. Okay? And is upper bounded by 1 over, again, your current gradient. So this is the relation on how close you are to the optimum. Right? This ratio is like how close I am to the optimum. And this is relating me how close I am to the optimum to, to my gradient. Right? So essentially, in English, the first inequality tells you that if the gradient is small, then suppose that you know, gamma is small. Right? Like if your gradient is small, this is very close to 1, which means that you're very close to being a minimizer, right? Because this is less than or equal to one, right? So the first inequality tells you if my gradient is small, my norm is close to the minimum. And the second inequality tells, well, if my norm is close to the minimum, right? Like this would be one, which means that this is almost zero, right? So this, if the norm is close to the minimum, the gradient is small. Okay, so this is a quantification on that non-commutative duality of kempf ness that we saw, right? Uh, and as a corollary, we can relate. So a solution to a norm minimization problem yields a solution to another scaling problem, where I give you like this is I give you the representation, the input point, and the accuracy parameter, right? So if I take this norm minimization, I convert it to a scaling problem with a different parameter, right? And on the other hand, is the same. If I give you a solution to the scaling problem, yields another solution to a norm minimization, right? That's what the duality is saying. Um, okay, and now I have five minutes. Okay, if you're not dead yet, let me just talk a little bit, because all this was the uni uniform setting, right? Where, remember, we had the moment polytope question. Remember that we set the p equals to zero, then we get null cone and norm minimization. Let's talk about the moment polytope, just for one slide, or two, at most two. So, uh, with the shifting. yes, with the shape. I'm just going to talk about the shifting a little bit now, right? So, okay, we have the moment map, and again, just recalling the moment polytope. And this is our general scaling problem, right? We solved the problem now that p is equal to zero. That was the norm minimization. Okay, so now we saw that this is related to capacity, and now we want to see if this problem here, right, if the general moment polytope problem, how is this related to capacity? We saw via the shifting that Brion proved that p is in the moment polytope of this action if and only if 0 is in the moment polytope of another action that we're going to see now why the action has to be this one. So I tensor this guy l times, and then I take some other vector, which is going to show, show up pretty quickly. So uh, OK, now I, we, we already saw this, that here we only shift the representation, right? Like, so we don't need to talk about that. OK. Now, uh, OK, so how do we shift to a different representation, right? So we have our moment polytope, and we have our target point P. So the natural attempt, since we saw in the commutative, is to say, well, take the spectrum and shift all the spectrum by P, right? But this has to correspond to a group action. So what group action will do that for us, right? Which group action will take our moment map and make our moment map look like that? So to do that, we just need these properties of the moment map. So one of the properties of the moment map is the following. If I take two representations, like the space V and W, right, the moment map of V tensor W is the sum. Okay? And if I take a highest weight vector, okay, remember that there is a set of weights. There is one weight that's the highest weight. I don't have time to talk about it now, but um, there is these special weights. Okay? So if you take a highest weight vector of weight uh, lambda, then the moment map of this representation applied to this highest weight is exactly this diagonal matrix with lambdas on top. Okay? So you can see how we're going to obtain P. Right? So now, what do we do? What is this shifting trick? How do we shift? If I take a target spectrum of marginals, suppose that these are all rationals, all of them with denominator L, let's say. Okay? So take this L such that this L times P becomes this vector lambda, an integer vector, 
okay? because these highest weights are encoded by integers. So this is an integral vector. Then we're going to take the following representation. Take your first action, and then tensor that times L. And then you take the product with the dual uh, highest weight, which essentially just makes like this diagonal here for this lambda star is the minus diagonal. Okay? And this new representation, which is gigantic, right? Like if your L is big, the moment map for this representation is equal to L times your small moment map plus the moment map of this highest weight, which gives you essentially like L times the moment map. Once you divide by L, you get minus diagonal of P. Okay? So that's how you shift. Okay? But the cool thing about the shifting trick is that like it doesn't need to come in your algorithm. It only comes in the analysis. You can still run your algorithm in your original space, and you can only use the shifting trick to analyze your algorithms. Okay? So if I give you an instance of the moment polytope problem, I can still run my algorithm in this small space, and my analysis will involve working on this bigger space. Okay? So this is how you shift, but you can work on the moment polytope problem. Um, okay. So, okay, so this reduces the arbitrary marginal problem to the uniform case, modulo some technical caveats that, you know, some, there is some randomization involved. No, I mean, you're, well, you're going to have to calculate your gradients shifted by P right all the time. It affects the groups that you're going to, it affects the elements that you're going to act in the groups. It's not going to be a vanilla algorithm in the same way, but it's going to be very analogous to that. Yeah. Right? So, yeah, it, it does, but not like, we don't need to work on that space. There is some things on the small space that corresponds to these actions on the big space. Uh, okay, so now just to summarize again. So capacity and moment polytope, how do they relate? OK, so we have this norm minimization problem, the capacity and the moment map, and the moment polytope problem. So on one hand, you have geodesic convexity, you know, which means that you can use this gradient you know, descent methods to solve the capacity problem. right? And this you know, formula was done by Kempf Ness, and we just have this quantitative uh, improvement. And now, how can capacity help in solving the moment polytope problem? You have the shifting trick by Brion, um, and you convert the moment polytope into a norm minimization problem. Right? So there's this cycle here that essentially they're the same problem. Um, yes, so that is the kind of summary of all of what we discussed now. Okay? And I'm going to, yeah, our work is quantitative versions of these statements. And uh, let me just go with some open questions, right? So uh, one open question is, can we get other efficient algorithms for more classes of geodesically convex functions, right? Because here, we only study the norm function and the moment polytope function, right? So the gradient function. The other question is, is the null cone problem in P for general group actions? So this non-commutative duality, as Avi was saying, essentially like morally puts this problem into NP intersection co NP. But we don't really know if you take the morally and you want to say factually, we don't even know if this is in NP intersection co NP. It'd be great to find out if it is. Um, and also another open question is, can we have more applications of this non-commutative optimization paradigm? So we had, the, we had all the four problems that I described in the beginning. There are a, a, some other problems that we have in our paper as well. But can we find more problems uh, that can in, be encoded into nice groups? Groups for which like this weight margin is large, for example, right? Um, yeah, and can we also extend more commutative optimization methods to non-commutative optimization? For instance, can we have this geodesic ellipsoid algorithm, right? It seems to be like a, ellipsoid is the most powerful theoretical tool we have, but can we extend this? Yeah, thank you.